Hey, it's Dr. Parker. Today, uh, I'm going to introduce the Canterbury Cathedral itself uh, and Canterbury, and then by way of that, the Canterbury Tales. And next week, I'll move more towards uh, talking about the general prologue to the tale. So this is going to be a, a little bit more of a general one and a little bit uh, a little bit more fun than a literary one, just strictly, I think. Uh, so you can see my little floor plan of the cathedral, but I'll, I'll move to something more legible now. Um, there is a photo of the cathedral as it looks now, and this has been, it's one of the oldest Christian churches in Britain because it was founded in 602. Um, St. Augustine the Lesser, who was the evangelist uh, sent by Pope Gregory, doesn't land until 597 A.D., and he, in fact, is the first uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. And the reason that Canterbury is the seat of the Church of England is because of its location, because it's so near uh, to France. It's where the first missionaries landed. Now, of course, there were Christians uh, in Britain in, uh, in, in earlier times, after the 300s, when the Romans invaded, uh, they brought some some priests and, and churches with them, but for the most part, those foundations uh, were lost during the Anglo-Saxon period, um, the, the early Anglo-Saxon period. But uh, Canterbury is the site, sort of the rebirth of Christianity in Britain, and there uh, is where the cathedral is. The building that you see uh, wasn't started until 1077, which of course is still... Uh, pretty early, and you can see this is a really fine example of Norman architecture, and there are some additions to it. You can see different architectural styles mixed in, as you can with most cathedrals. Uh, but there it is. Um, here is a photo from the altar looking down the nave, uh, and the candle is where the tomb of St. Thomas uh, a Becket, who's very important to us, used to be, and we don't have it now, and, and I'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, this is this is the same view, but looking from the other side. This is looking from the nave of the church towards the altar. And you can see a candle burning there. Uh, Thomas Becket Shrine was right there, right in the, the front of the church near the altar. And during the reign of Henry VIII, when the Catholic Church was being driven out, uh, Thomas Becket was certainly one of the Catholic saints that Henry was the most concerned with expunging, with getting rid of the memory of, that that was uh, a good example of the kind of uh, papist uh, idolatry, according to Henry, that he didn't want to be a part of. So uh, the tomb was was ripped up, and uh, the sarcophagus was opened, and we actually don't know where the body of, of St. Thomas is. It's, it's somewhere, was, you know, cast into a pit somewhere, uh, which was one of the great damages of Henry VIII's uh, reign was his destruction of, of churches and uh, sarcophagi and tombs and things like that, the solution of the monastery. So uh, there's a candle burning there now, and you can see this little sign over to the right. You can't really read it, but I think it reads something to the effect of this is where the tomb of Thomas was uh, in former times before it was removed by Henry VIII. But if you go, if you're facing uh, that area where the tomb is and you turn to the left and you walk a few feet, they actually do know where Thomas was killed. It's, it's a little bit uh, off of the main part of the, the church, I mean, just barely. And uh, they've made sort of a Latter-day shrine to it. So you can see it's very modern. I think this was done in the, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, but the sculpture depicting the, uh, the two knives uh, or two swords that were used to kill him, and, and then the cross. Uh, and this is supposed to be right at the spot uh, where it happened. So you can kneel there and light a candle uh, to St. Thomas. Uh, and in fact, there is a kneeling stone uh, right there at the site. So even though you can't, like the Canterbury pilgrims, could of course see the body, uh, or at least see the tomb of St. Thomas, we can't do that now, but we can uh, see the site where he was murdered. And for some people, this continues to be a little bit of a place of um, pilgrimage. Uh, there, for a while, this was removed in 2012, but there was a, a temporary uh, sculpture of Thomas, which was uh, hanging from the uh, ceiling uh, right at about the same spot that I just showed you, and it's a really striking, uh, stunning sculpture. It's made of nails, which, of course, represents martyrdom in the same way it represents the crucifixion. So there's the, uh, the statue of Thomas as it was. 
Um, the <laughs> once you move to the wall around the cathedral, things get a little bit more commercial. And and please do go to Canterbury if you ever get a chance. Uh, there is a very uh, thriving industry around both the cathedral and the Canterbury Tales. And as you can see in the wall. Uh, that's not actually the wall of the cathedral, but it's the wall of the cathedral close, which is kind of a little area around the cathedral. There is, yes, uh, a Starbucks embedded uh, there. So so if you're wondering, is nothing sacred? The answer is yes, nothing is sacred, and you can get your, your coffee there. Uh, and if that were not enough, you can uh, buy, you can go online. Uh, and purchase a this tasteful uh, souvenir, uh, the Old English Sheepdog version of St. Thomas a Beckett, um, entitled A Canterbury Tale. And uh, yes, I, I just reference that to you without comment. That's that's something that exists in the world. That's that's really all you need to know. So, uh, moving away from the actual city of, of Canterbury, the Cathedral of Canterbury, uh, to the Canterbury Tale. So, we have these in several manuscripts, and there, there's some debate about which is the best manuscript, and we won't get too far into manuscript studies here. Uh, suffice it to say, one of the main differences between manuscripts is the order of the tales varies. And this is important insofar as you believe that Chaucer meant for the tales uh, to have a certain order. And if so, what does the order of the tales tell us that he's wanting to tell us? Is there a theme? Is there a progression? Is there an evolution that we're, we're meant to see? Uh, and, and a lot of people argue, in fact, that, that there is such a thing. Uh, the Ellesmere manuscript is usually, I would say for most people, is the best ordering of the tales. A lot of people use the Ellesmere ordering with what's called the Bradshaw shift, where a couple of the tales are, are shifted over. Um, but for the most part, Ellesmere, uh, we like. Uh, we also like Ellesmere because it's very pretty, as you can see. It's a lovely manuscript, and it's got, uh, there's your picture of Chaucer. This is, by the way, if you're interested in manuscripts, if you look at the top uh, of the page, it says, Here beginneth Chaucer's tale of Melibe. Um, and then it says, A young man called Melibius, mighty, and something, something, something. Uh, but that is that is Middle English. That's a good uh, late Middle English secretary hand is what we would call that kind of handwriting uh, with really nice decoration on the initials and like I say of course the nice illumination of Chaucer. We also get from that um, this picture of the knight which is, is, is fairly well known uh, and actually does keep to the description of the knight pretty well. We'll talk about him in a couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, there's there's our wife of Bath, and there she is wearing, wearing red because she likes uh, red, and with heavy cover chips on her head, which is something that we we also read about her. Uh, Canterbury Tales has survived in the um, cultural memory, and it's interesting for a lot of people. It is a kind of a fun, racy, uh, cute bunch of stories that have a little bit of a, a, of a sexy element to them. And, and certainly those things are in there, but it, it's not the bulk of what's in there. Uh, but here you see uh, it's been turned into a musical. It's actually been turned into at least two musicals that I know of and probably more. Uh, this is one from the, uh, from the 60s. Uh, the 60s really liked Canterbury Tales because they felt like it was sort of a, I don't know, a retro hippie movement or something like that. Um, and there was a uh, Pasolini in, I think, 1973, made, no, 1972, sorry, uh, made a quasi-pornographic uh, version of the Canterbury Tales. And uh, you can see the poster, which is, is the only, I probably shouldn't even show you that, but it's certainly the only thing I can show you. Um, I've not seen it, but I don't recommend it. Um, so the Canterbury Tales, we, we've all heard of the Canterbury Tales, and we've mostly read some of the Canterbury Tales, although they're not necessarily uh, something everybody's looked at. Uh, but, but what kind of a thing are they? So the first thing I want to get at, and this is something that you should keep in mind uh, throughout our study of the Canterbury Tales, is that Chaucer has chosen this trope of pilgrimage for his, for his work. And it, it works on a lot of different levels. There are a lot of really good reasons that he chose it. Uh, and so 
the first thing I want to say is that as a literary device, so the, the, the basic outline of the, the story is that you've got a group of, of about 30 people. They, they have by chance met each other at a hotel in London, uh, knowing that the next day they're all going to go on a pilgrimage to Canterbury, which is about 60 miles. Uh, so it's two days ride there, uh, two days ride back. And um, they're each going to tell two stories on the way there and two stories on the way back. Now, all of these stories weren't written. Like I said, we only have about, um, depending on how you count, somewhere in the 20s in the Canterbury Tales, uh, 30 pilgrims telling four stories each, of course, would be 120 stories. And we don't, we don't feel that Chaucer was ever planning to write that many stories, although he, also, he died before we think. Uh, he completed everything, so it's hard to say how many stories he would have. But what it works really well for as a literary device is the fact this is what we call a framed story, and it's sort of like uh, The Thousand and One Nights. Here you've got one master narrative, which is the narrative of the pilgrimage, within which you can embed a bunch of shorter stories. Uh, so Chaucer, some of these he might have had in his desk drawer uh, looking for a home. Some of them he might have invented for the occasion. Uh, but it's sort of a way of creating a work that encompasses every kind of genre, from the very pious and holy to romance to uh, adventure to, um, yeah, dirty jokes to body stories. And yet they all sort of find a home in this one uh, framework. And so I think one reason he uses the device of pilgrimage is to provide, uh, you know, enough space to stick as many stories as he wants to of, of various kinds in there. A second reason that pilgrimage is a great uh, way to, um, to, to stage the story is that it's one of the few instances in the medieval world where all of these sorts of people would be at the same place at the same time. In, in typical life, the miller and the prioress would have nothing to do with each other. They wouldn't encounter each other. They wouldn't speak to each other. Uh, and, and you can say the same for, for many pairs of characters. Uh, in the Canterbury Tales. These are not people that would, would be together. So if Chaucer wants to create a story that does, in fact, include people from, and I won't say all walks of life, what we'll talk about next week when we get into the general prologue, these people are all of the middle class, which is this relatively new class uh, in Chaucer's time. But there's nobody who's extremely wealthy, um, and there's nobody who's extremely poor, uh, with maybe one exception on each end of that scale. But for the most part, these are, are the middling classes, and they're all um, being pulled together uh, in a way that they, they almost never would in real life. Um, but pilgrimage was becoming a really popular thing, especially for the middle class. It was um, the predecessor of modern-day tourism. This is what you did when you had a little bit of spare time and a little bit of spare money. Um, unlike a really wealthy person, your whole life wasn't sort of a vacation. Uh, but unlike a really poor person, you didn't have to work all day, every day, just to scrape by with no extra income and no time for enjoyment or recreation. You fell sort of in between these, these things where, yes, you had to work, but maybe you could take a week off uh, in the springtime. Maybe you had a little bit of extra spending money to sort of pay your way for a journey like this. Uh, it's uh, the religious reasons aside, which is, is the reason they're supposed to be going on this pilgrimage, uh, it's it's a great social mixer. It's a great way to meet people. Uh, I certainly think the wife of Bath is um, here to meet her next husband. Um, and in, in general, it was sort of like I said, the the predecessor of the package tour of the of the cruise ship of the spring break. Uh, the pilgrims go on this trip in in April on that April, so they go uh, when the sun is shining, the flowers are blooming, and it's a pleasant time to um, to travel, which wasn't true all year round in in England. So that's um, the, the cultural mixing of this group, I think, is another reason he uses the device of the pilgrimage. And finally, the device of the pilgrimage is, is fairly well known in medieval literature as a metaphor for life, that you were, you were born into this world or into this veil of tears, however you want to look at it, uh, and you travel uh, your life's road until your death. And the way that you conduct yourself during that journey determines what happens to you after your death. So this is a... Um, this world is a transient place. It's one you travel through uh, metaphorically from your birth to your death. And if you want to take the tack, and we'll talk about this again some more uh, later on, that Chaucer is presenting a, 
bunch of different ways of looking at the world. With each teller and each tale, there's a different sort of worldview on display and that Chaucer's giving you these alternative ways of uh, looking at the universe, of, of life philosophies, that so that you can sort of judge for yourself. And Chaucer's very non-judgmental, but you as the reader can sort of say, this is a good way to live a life, or this is a, a poor way to live a life. Uh, and um, eventually this helps you to kind of arrive at your own life philosophy or something like that. So um, that's the... Um, that's the idea of the pilgrimage, and this entire thing is is based around a group of pilgrimage pilgrims going from London to Canterbury and back. And as far as we know, they they never get there. We never hear anything about uh, their trip once they uh, get started, except that we hear some of their some of their stories. So that's um, that's it for this time. And um, I'll set some discussion questions, but this week I'm going to make them a little bit more open ended. Uh, a little bit more of you asking me questions uh, about the Canterbury Tales, kind of give you a break from the grilling I've been giving you. And um, then next week we'll launch back more into um, a, a more focused study of the general prologue uh, of the Canterbury Tales itself. But I thought we'd use this week as a little bit of an intro and to give you some background. So uh, I hope you have a good week and I'll be in touch.